This week, it's The Law of Equivalent Exchange, Episode 4. You can support all our shows and help us reach a goal to make this podcast more frequent and in its own feed by supporting us at patreon.com slash deconcomics. The Law of Equivalent Exchange. This is Tim in Tokyo with Patrick in Kumamoto. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Doing good. Welcome back. Right. Yeah. So what you've been listening to, the first three chapters were what we recorded back in March. And then they just kind of sat in the can for a while. And we were waiting for, waiting to reach the goal on Patreon to make this a full-fledged series. And we finally just decided to put them out once a month in the deconstructing comics feed as sort of an advertisement for the podcast and please give to the Patreon so that we reach the goal. And then we will uh, put this in its own feed and come out more often than we have been. Um, so yeah, those were recorded in March. This is being recorded in November, November 2nd. Um, and Having edited, well, as we record this, I've edited and released the first two, and I, I, I felt like the episodes dragged a bit, and it's kind of walking through the plot can be not the most interesting approach. So I think we're going to change it a little bit this time, see how it goes, um, just sort of quickly summarize chapter four, and then just, you know, go wherever whatever we want to comment on in the chapter. So, uh, this is called The Battle on the Train. In the story, the Elrics, uh, Ed and Al, are on a train that's hijacked by extremists who take a general and his family hostage. And we watch as Al and Ed beat the hijackers and rescue the general's family. We also finally, well, for the first time, we meet Colonel Roy Mustang, uh, who reveals at the very end that he is the Flame Alchemist, and also his first lieutenant, Hawkeye, uh, a woman, who, and they're both you know, in the military for a mistress. The title page of this chapter is a little puzzling um, until you read to the end of the chapter, and then it kind of makes sense. But it's called The Battle on the Train, but what we see, it has nothing to do with a train. It's Ed asleep at his desk uh, with a bunch of books strewn around. It looks like he's been he's got a pen in his hand as he's sleeping. Um, and we don't know what that has to do with <laughs> when we see it there. Um, but right. a, couple, a couple pages in, we see him asleep, like really deeply asleep. Mm -hmm. But... At first read, you don't really tie those things together, necessarily. Right. Well, you know, at the near the end of this chapter, uh, after they've defeated the hijackers and they're in the train station and they've met up with Mustang and Hawkeye, um, he mentions in in a very tiny word balloon, "I pulled an all nighter the other night." Um, where he's talking about how he's been researching the ancient texts and trying to find a way to change or to get back the parts of his body and all of Al's body. So that's what he was doing there. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's nothing to do with a train. So it's a little puzzling at, at the time. But hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it kind of uh, lets us know a little bit of what we're going to be in for and what uh you know al and uh elric are uh i mean the elric brothers are yeah. kind of looking to do mm -hmm. uh, and so that's yeah this this chapter this chapter seems kind of like a break between the serious you know uh hmm. 
between the more serious uh, chapters because uh, they don't. There's not a lot of uh, difficulty <laughs> overcoming these bad guys. Right. Yeah, they're pushovers, and yeah, almost all of the violence is played for comedy. Uh, like several times, these hijackers fire their guns at Al and bullets bounce off and hit them like in the leg or something. Um, it just, it happens at least three times. It seems like two of the times we don't even actually see it. We just hear it. Um, yeah, Al, Al is trying to like, uh, guys, you know, you shouldn't fire this gun. Ah, oh, you did it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to tell you, don't do that. <laughs> I like that. I like that part. That was uh, there was a lot of comedy, uh, a lot of knees in the face, a lot of slapstick kind of stuff. Like uh, uh, after he's woken up, and yeah, he uh, he quickly dispatches the the guy in front of him. Um, you know, does a little alchemy on his weapon, turns yeah. into like a bent trumpet, and then kicks him in the head with his metal. Uh, metal foot and then they take care of another one and so he's like he's putting on a good show for everybody and everybody's like oh wow that's awesome you know this guy's this guy's gonna save us and he says who they're like who are you guys and he's like haha we're alchemists <laughs> then he climbs out the window <laughs> and he almost gets like blown away from the <laughs> from the hmm. that's, I, lo I love that timing there it was just perfect well, we should mention that the, those first two hijackers that he beats up after waking up, the, the main, his main uh, reason for beating them up was because one of them called him a runt. <laughs> uh, not so much because they're hijackers, but just because they insulted him. And he's so angry that he's just sort of automatically beating them up without even thinking. When uh, he's beating up the second guy and Al says... Big brother, big brother, if you don't stop, he's going to die. And then there's a silent panel. And then Ed says, so um, who are these guys? And Al thinks, so he was just subconsciously reacting to the word runt. So when he says, uh, when he's beating the second guy up uh, in Japanese, he's like, who are you calling a... He uses mijinko to... Mijinko do chibi. So it's like... A, Super runt, but he's also throwing in the word mijinko, which is like water fleas, which are like these microscopic <laughs> creatures. I'm wondering what that is in English. What um, is. So in, in English, he says, you call me a runt, a dwarf, a little person. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> huh they went they went an interesting direction with that. <laughs> uh, water fleas. Huh? Yeah. Little microscopic Hmm. I guess they they wanted to stick with actual actual insults that are levied at short people in English. So runt, dwarf, and little person, little person in quotation marks. But uh, yeah, which I don't know. I, I I find a little bit awkward just because you know little person is actually what the accepted term is these days. Yeah, well, I mean they could have gone with midget. <laughs> Midget's one that's not really acceptable anymore. That's right. That's right. I mean, I guess there's all kinds of little uh, little words they could have used uh, for... I'm trying to remember what I was called, because I was kind of short mm. and uh, little. And you know, I could hide anywhere. There was that <laughs> advantage. But other than that, not a, not a whole lot of advantage of being teeny tiny. Um Runt, yeah, runt. Runt was one. So, I mean, I'm always noticing in this comic the how different aspects of this world seem to come from different eras of our world. And, like, if you look at this, this general and his family um, on the train, in the first page when they're just kind of hanging out in their train compartment uh, before the hijackers come in, in the next on the next page. So... The general's suit, I don't know, it kind of makes me think like 1930s or 40s. But the way his wife is dressed, she reminds me so much of Hillary Clinton. 
She looks somehow <laughs> more modern than he does. I, I know exactly what you're talking about because uh, it's hard to like, like kind of pin it down as to when, mm-hmm. what kind of era we can equate this to because the fact that he's taking this uh family vacation on a train on you know uh taking a day off and the wife's like are you okay can you is it okay for you to take a day off and and uh he's like yeah i finally got a vacation this is very modern like japanese mm-hmm. family mm-hmm. taking a trip kind of uh, but they're situation on a, but they're on a steam train <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's just the the situation itself is still like conversation that you would hear mm-hmm. like in consent for sure, you know. Finally getting that day off and uh he's cuz he in Japanese he uses the the word like kazukusabis, family mm-hmm. service. Ah, yeah, that, that sounds very modern. Modern term. Uh so and this is something that happens in comics sometimes but what i do what i do like is that they the bad guy you definitely get a bad guy feel from him you know he he doesn't seem like quite the push over the other the other guys do at least you know through his uh his how he's designed and his words and actions uh like when the the general basically talks back to him like he shoots his earlobe off. Yeah. You know. And uh and but also it's not quite clear, but it looks like that, you know, they've killed the uh like the bodyguards. Mm-hmm. I mean it look like they're just knocked out. I mean there's blood on the wall and yeah. there's like blood on the clothes and you know, the panel itself is kind of grayed out, I guess, mm-hmm. to uh I don't know. I guess kind of keep keep the image subdued a little bit, but uh, but so yeah, we I mean, do feel that the, the, the violence the violence committed by the bad guys is not played for comedy, but uh, no. Ed's violence is. Yeah, I mean he doesn't kill anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, they all get captured. But yeah, but when the bad guy like whips out his arm gun, it's uh, yeah, it's a cool looking gun. You know, and it's got like uh, kind of clips and lots of power, two barrels, and yeah, it's it's quite an intimidating looking guy. Did I understand that the the lead hijacker's name is Bald? Um, yes. Yeah. Bar- so after uh, Ed creates a cannon on the roof of the train and fires it at one of the terrorists, then that terrorist is back inside the train and he addresses the leader as bald, even though he is not bald. But it might be, you know, it might be Bardo. You mm. know what I mean? I mean, it's in Kana, it's Bardo, which if it was English bald, they, that's not how they would write it in Japanese. They would write that. Yeah, bad. okay. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I had a feeling there was something fishy there. So it's, it's not yeah. the best conversion of, from the Katakana. Yeah, it could be Bardo or Baldo, you know? Yeah, Bardo yeah. sounds a lot more likely to me. Yeah. There is a different terrorist who is bald. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's not he's not talking to him. But, you know, this guy's no nonsense. He hears some noise on the roof and he fires away, you know? And if... It, if uh, when he shoots Ed in the foot... You know, Ed, Ed makes it clear that it was lucky that they got shot yeah, in the uh, automobile leg. Ottoman leg, mm-hmm. auto leg yeah. Yeah, the left uh, leg. So, you know, that's. You definitely feel like he, this guy's not somebody that you want to mess with. But I really like. I really like Ed's solution, you know, to make sure that. Uh, that nobody gets hurt. But I, before I mention that, I should say that uh, the fact that you have the people on the train, the uh, the people shoveling the coal, mm-hmm. jumping in as soon yeah. as they get a, a chance and taking out their uh, their captors, I thought that was really nice. 
Right. Yeah. When Ed Ed goes to the engine first to kind of take back control of the driving of the train, and when he comes in, it creates enough of a distraction that the coal shoveling guys have have a chance to whack the hijackers with their shovels. Yeah, it's really good. It's really good. Uh, and they ask him if there's anything more we can do for you, and uh, he says, "Yeah, just drive safely." Um, in the in the train car where when Ed is sleeping uh, early in the story, and you see the two hijackers there with their guns and uh, the other passengers around them, and there's a sound effect in that panel. These it's really tiny. It's a little hard to read in English. It looks like it's clata 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 clata. Is that the train sound or? This is the panel after you see him sleeping. Right. Yeah, that's the train. It's saying gatan tatan gatan tatan gatan. Because I wondered if it was the the sound of being nervous as a hostage. <laughs> Not very uh, clear. See that? Yeah, that, I I see what you're saying because that would be more like a gata gata gata. But because in, uh, in Japanese, there's a sound effect for everything, even things that don't make right. a sound. But what you're saying is totally understandable because the placement of the sound effects, they're just above people Mm -hmm. each time. And when there's no people, there's also no sound. So Mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, I can see how that's a little bit harder to read. Yeah, but Gatan Katan is pretty clear that it's the train. Okay. Well, what were you saying the English sound effect was? Klata Klata, which I don't really (laughs) like as a train sound effect. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> but, you know, I think, you know, Americans don't ride trains very much, so we don't have such a conventional train sound as Japanese do, where people ride trains all the time. Well, I mean, we do, but it's not necessary that, the, the, like, the clackety clack mm-hmm. of the the metal wheels on the, on on the, track. the, the train track. It's more of the chugga chugga that we you mm. that we kind of pick. Yeah, or choo choo or something like like which is more of a steam train where this is a right. sound any train could make. Yeah, that's right. And the interior is so much like just a regular Japanese subway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no strap handles, but <laughs> Yeah, it it looks uh, like, you know, one of those trains that are more kind of out in the country with the seats that face each other, face forward or backward, rather than That's along right. the sides. It seems to be modeled on that kind of train in Japan. Where, where it's more of a, not necessarily like commuter is right. the only function. Like having people in groups of four, like family type, mm-hmm. is also you know, a function of having the, the seats like that. Hmm. Hmm. Thanks to our supporters on Patreon, another set of classic early episodes of Deconstructing Comics has been unlocked, and I'm putting them back on the site in reverse order. This week I'll republish number 40, from September 11, 2006, in which Brandon and I discuss The Nevermen, Seal Team 7, The Marquis Intermezzo, Pride of Baghdad, and DMZ, plus another behind-the-scenes look at Spider-Hag, Find the classic episodes on our Facebook and Twitter feeds by choosing the earliest months listed in the sidebar pull-down menu at deconstructingcomics.com, in publicly available posts on our Patreon page, or in the Patreon smartphone app. Classic episodes have been unlocked back to number 31, so only nine more classic episodes will be re-released unless we meet our next Patreon goal unlocking 15 more classic episodes and putting this Full Metal Alchemist podcast, The Law of Equivalent Exchange, in its own feed and on a more frequent release schedule. Check out all our goals and help us reach them at patreon.com slash deconcomics. Tim and Paul race to the scene, where a 1960s Batman TV episode needs analyzing. The show's attitude toward civics. A loyal taxpayer stooping to criminal methods. Toward women. A dish. Toward time management. All in all, Batman, you've been pretty busy. As well as the history, the casting, and more. Tune in via iTunes or Stitcher, or visit tothebatpoles.libsyn.com for... To the Batpoles. So, 
what's this chapter trying to accomplish? I mean, obviously, part of it is starting to introduce the military, uh, Mustang and Hawkeye, um, and we'll meet more of them later. Now, we see a few of them here, but they're just kind of, most of them are just kind of side characters, I think. Well, actually, a couple of these guys on, on the the first military page, I recognize them, but it's been a while since I read this story. I don't remember their names. They do show up more later. A couple of things that I've noticed is that, you know, it's really showing the the flexibility of what uh, Ed's alchemy can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also its ingenuity. So like I said, mentioned before, how he subdues the bad guys is that he connects the uh, water cars water through a pipe which he invented yeah, uh, not invented created but, with alchemy I'm sure alchemy uh, to and then the water is pumped into the car and so basically everybody is uh, unable to unable to do a whole lot with water flooding <laughs> in yeah uh, and then Al lets the water out, and uh, basically most of the bad guys are incapacitated, but the main bad guy, he's still ready for action. But what we find out, another thing we find out is that uh, Ed's auto mail is of a higher quality mm. than, than auto mail. Yeah, yeah, because he, he yeah. makes that comment. You know, you bought the cheaper model, didn't you? Uh, just before... Al comes in and and knocks him out. You know, it, it does kind of come across. We don't really like get into it right now, but it's like there is definitely some economic disparity going on. Hmm. You know, and and I don't think it, it's an important. I don't think it's like touched on as an important point right here, but I think it is congruent with stuff that happens uh, later on. Hmm. Well, yeah. I mean. Being in the military and the full metal alchemist, um, he's probably got government funding to get the, the best equipment. That's right. That's right. But, you know, the, uh, you mentioned the uh, Mustang. We're introduced to Mustang. He does show up a little bit at the very beginning when he's informed about the uh, extremists taking over the train. But once he realizes that... Uh, Ed and Al are on the train. He's like, oh, okay, maybe I can pop off early because I still have a date that I want to get to. Right, yeah, so they he was st- worried he was going to have to stay late and cancel his date. But, oh, no, the Full Metal Alchemist is on board. You know, we, we might be lucky here. <laughs> well, he, he doesn't he also say, like, uh, you know, maybe we just, the, those those guys take the general so that I can have my date. <laughs> Something <laughs> like that at the beginning. Uh, I'm sure he's joking, but obviously, like, his social life is important to him. And we don't know much about Hawkeye yet, but she she becomes one of my favorite characters. Mm-hmm. She's really cool. And, but when he, well, when the bad guy pulls, like, a knife or out of, uh, or I guess it's like a a sharpened point from his broken... His, his uh, auto arm. arm, yeah, and he used it to escape, cut his bonds, and escape. And the and uh, he's about to, Hawkeye's about to shoot him, and uh, Mustang's more like, "No, nah, I'll take care of this." <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what he says in English. And yeah, he just snaps his fingers, and there's a big explosion that knocks the bad guy off his feet. And he says, I took it easy on you. If you try to resist again, I'll turn you into ash. Got it? I like how before he actually lets the uh, energy flow from his hand, it shows like the tension of him putting his fingers together like he's about ready to snap. Yeah, and there's a tap sound as he's just kind of bringing the fingers together, which is a little confusing. I had wasn't thinking of that as making a sound, but... It's not a tap sound in Japanese. It's like a goo. It's like a a sound of something being uh, forced like of squeezing to get very strongly. Yes, like a yeah, like a squeeze okay. or a push but, or something. Yeah, like what that. would that be in English? I can't think of a squeezing sound in in English. Well, I don't think in 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 English, like just having those tension lines around the thumb, mm. maybe strengthen a little more. And then in English, we wouldn't really use. Uh, 
a sound effect for that. Yeah, the motion lines could have done all the work there. But in, you know, in Japanese, it's there's always a, a much fuller, deeper soundtrack, and so <laughs> I think there's there's a tendency to put like basically to mic everything, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I I don't think it detracts, but yeah, but in English, we're I think we're used to saving the sound effects for very specific scenes, and also the fact that we don't have this rich library mm-hmm. of. Um, onomatopoeia that is already connected to meanings in everybody's mind like they do in Japanese. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so the person translating the sound effects is at a disadvantage because they don't have all the tools that that the Japanese sound effects writer would uh, have. And sometimes I understand when translators just romanize the Japanese sound effects. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not the best solution but uh it's basically if you can train your readers to connect to that sound with that sound effect then eventually it becomes successful whether or not it actually sounds like that because japanese sound effects are they have to be stylistic because there's only like 50 sounds in like 50 different phonemes in the japanese language which Mm -hmm. is one of the few all the languages on the planet yeah. not the fewest one of the fewest mm-hmm. so style it comes from that from having fewer choices and so we don't expect the sound effects to actually sound uh sound like our ears hear them but uh but if the meaning is there it works you know and yeah that's a that's a challenge but the fact that every country that puts these out does you know does what they can to like translate those sounds i think is amazing because Mm. i think i've mentioned before on this uh podcast if not on your other one that they have not bothered with translating american sound effects in japan since like 1978 (laughs) 1978 was a big year for translated american comics because they had dc and marvel content coming out and the same guy was involved (laughs) (laughs) and he didn't translate any of the sound effects except for like uh breath exhaling and stuff like that but uh i i recently picked up the french version of this and let me just see what they did with the <laughs> okay the stuff. because sometimes these french ones are sometimes they do from the from the english and not from the japanese sometimes you know what i mean hmm. uh this cur cur for the squeezing of the thumb what is it cur cur c r r c r r which I guess, if with a French accent, it'd be because the er wouldn't be the sound. It would be like like that. It still doesn't. And then fur for the energy shooting out of his hand. Bruch, bruch. That's definitely a French sound effect. <laughs> but dash, a dash is there in English. Oh yeah. Yeah, the energy. So after he snaps his fingers, there's a big snap, and then. It says flare, F L A R E. So it's just like saying what it's doing. <laughs> it's flaring. See, what I love about like the French sound effects is like where we would definitely tend to make the k sound into k's because mm. they're somehow more dramatic. They're in French. They always like pretty much keep them c's. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, C L A C clack for yeah. snap in English. So that's, I think, and that's, I'd like to know more about that, but that's, you know, like, I'd have to study more about, uh, I'm sure it's uh, a feature of the language itself. But yeah, but we we get an idea that Roy Mustang is a, you know, he's very sure of himself and he thinks he's good looking. And then what does the last panel say is uh, after the, after the, the story's over? The extra. Oh, the, the extra, extra section. 
Yeah, in volume yeah. two, we will be switching protagonists, and the series will be retitled Flame Alchemist. And then in tiny words at the bottom, that's not true. <laughs> so it's kind of establishing there that uh, that uh, the Flame Alchemist is a bit stuck up or a bit vain. Then there are these yes, yeah. three uh, four-panel strips, and I think we should give a little explanation of the second one because uh, it's making some cultural references there that uh, uh, non-Japanese wouldn't necessarily know. Right. Where, where uh, so Al is complaining, you know, this body's a little inconvenient because it's too big. Big brother, you should have put my spirit in something a little smaller. Ed says, there was nothing I could do. That was the best thing I could find that was human-shaped in the room at that time. There must have been something better. And then the third panel shows these two figures whose eyes are blacked out as if we're trying to preserve their anonymity. Um, but they're very recognizable figures in Japan. Uh, one is Pekochan, the little girl who she's the mascot of Fujiya Cake Shop, which is a chain Um and the, the, st the statue is always sitting out. Statue, it's probably plastic or something, but it's... It's basically like a small size bobblehead because the head moves. Hmm. So yeah, she's a little girl with her tongue sticking out as she's licking her lips. Because the cakes are so good. Um, then the other figure, I had to look up his name. Um, he is Kui Daore Taro. Yeah, he's an Osaka, an Osaka staple. Yeah. So he was, uh, so he's kind of a clown uh, in a red and white striped suit with a pointed hat that's also red and white striped. Um, he was the mascot of a restaurant called Kui Daore from 1949 to 2008. And uh, I found that when it closed, then they just put the statue the figure in the lobby of an office building the nakaza Ku kui daore building so that's where he still stands to this day when <laughs> when my when my in-law went to osaka they bought me some they bought me some socks <laughs> with this character which uh i always like i have to pick my moments to wear them <laughs> there yeah, I saw a picture of these socks uh, on uh, jpinfo.com. Those might be your well, feet. I got I don't some. Know. <laughs> Just a quick interesting thing about uh, Peko-chan. Uh, she is actually a swipe. She was swiped directly from Bird's Eye Orange Juice ad from, the, from 1949. And Peko showed up with the exact same features. Hmm. Even the same color ribbon in her hair with the same tongue sticking out uh, one year later in 1950. Hmm. And, uh, well, yeah, I think there there were a number of swipes like that. Um, I don't know if I still see it now, but um, there was a bread trunk company here that had a, a picture on their truck that looked a lot like the Sunbeam uh thing with the, the little girl holding a slice of bread in two hands and biting into it. Ah. You know, I used to see the same thing for sunbeam bread. Well, it's probably been a few decades ago now. <laughs> uh, but that's I've seen it in Japan much more recently. That's that's another swipe. And I feel like I've seen others that are clearly based on American counterparts. <laughs> you know, they're the same kind of product usually. Right, right. So, yeah, but these, uh, I think most people like Peko chan, she's kind of a, a very well known icon. And I don't think many people know that she was actually uh, lifted, <laughs> like, uh, had been borrowed from uh, an orange juice ad. But, mm. yeah, but I mean, if you do a quick search on the internet, it shows up quite quickly. It's basically like you have these two characters that are put out in front of shops and kind of have movement uh, because of bobblehead or whatever. And uh, just imagine if that 
if Al was put into one of those instead of <laughs> <laughs> instead of the armor. And Al says, "No, I'm good. I'm good." <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Yeah. Hmm. So that's the end of the first volume, and we were talking ahead of time here, and I think I think I might have known this a long time ago, but. Um, there's a page in the back of the English version uh, showing Ed being, you know, his hands are being held by Mustang and Al who are wearing trench coats and hats. And uh, Ed is drawn in a very comic way, like he's a little boy and he's angry. Um, and that picture, so in the Japanese the Japanese version has a, what, a dust jacket. Yes, yes. Most Japanese comics have dust jackets. And usually when you take off the dust jacket, the illustrations on the front and the back are basically the same. But not always. Hmm. So, yeah, this picture that I just described is on the front of the book under the dust jacket. And it also shows Cornello from the first two chapters who died and it's a little rectangular thing where he is an angel and rising to heaven and it says in memoriam and the reason it's this oblong shape is because in the japanese version it's on the spine under the dust jacket and i never noticed that until you mentioned it so when <laughs> i was looking for, i wonder what could be under here there he is on the spine in with his little angel halo Flying up. Does it uh, say something like in memoriam? It says nothing. It just has it just has uh, the title, the number, that art of uh, Cornello, and then the the author's name. So it's mm -hmm. it's just kind of there with no explanation. Okay. But the back illustration we couldn't find in the English version, right? No. Yeah. It's what is that? A dog with Al's helmet yeah. on. Yes, it's a dog with Al's helmet on, and, and he's saying, Nissan, big brother. <laughs> so, but yeah, maybe that, that's that doesn't preview. exist in the English version. Maybe that's a preview of something that's going to happen in the next... Well, the next, there yeah. is a dog in the next volume. I do recall that. He is such a good girl. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay, so that's uh, chapter four and volume one. And we'll be back next time with chapter five. Uh, and you know, the law of equivalent exchange means... You get what you pay for. <laughs> See you next time. Next time. Our theme is Cryosyncope by Winterfiend. You can help this podcast become more frequent and have its own exclusive feed by supporting us at patreon.com slash deconcomics. Listen next Wednesday for my talk with Mulele about the movie Thor from 2011, a discussion recorded in the spring of 2019 and previously only available to patrons. See you then.